Corinthian is called an ironic tale by its author, Herbert Coby. You will see his name on books, on playbills, on television, and on the chassis of some of your own farm machinery. And tonight, you will meet Herbert Coby on Books on Trial. Dr. David Bruner of the Iowa State College Department of English and Speech is again your host. Good evening. This evening we have, I think, a real treat in store for us, and we're going to depart a little bit from our usual procedure. Dr. Leonard Feinberg, the Department of English and Speech at the Iowa State College, and a specialist in the study of satire. That's right, isn't it, Len? That's right, I'm a specialist. And I are going to have the pleasure of talking with an author about his book. The book, The Blonde Corinthian. The author, Herbert C. Coby, who has been good enough to come to us this evening and discuss the book and, I presume, many other things with it. Is that correct? Yes, sir? Your pleasure. Thank you. The blurbs on the jacket of his book describe Herbert Coby as a young writer of talent and imagination. I'm sure we can vouch for that. Graduate of Harvard, he has been at various times a factory worker, a salesman, and a playwright. Uh, I might say simultaneously. In talking with Mr. Kobe earlier this evening, I learned that in addition to the play Exodus, which was produced in, in New York in 1948-9, something right. like that, and another play called Stranger in the Hills, an Irish play, which Mr. Kobe tells me was translated into Spanish and played in Cuba. He is at present engaged in adapting the book under discussion tonight, The Blonde Corinthian, for Jose Ferrar, who will act in it in New York next year. In addition, is doing an adaptation of Zola's Nana, which I understand Miss Alona Mathy is going to take part in. You're traveling in very high company. Thank you. In addition to that, he is at present engaged in writing a novel on the Agamemnon story and tells us that his interest isn't in the children. The story goes downhill after the man and wife story. What is the particular angle in that man and wife story that uh, you're interested in? Well, it's the relationship of the husband and wife and uh, something which, uh, this, uh, you understand the Agamemnon story has been done several times. O'Neill did a beautiful job on it, and Robertson Jefferson also did. But they left out some, uh, one thing that's been very interesting to me, that Agamemnon, first of all, was in love with Helen. And Helen turned him down for Menelaus, who she eventually married. Then Agamemnon married her sister, Clytemnestra. Later in life, after they'd had a family, lived reasonably happy together, he went off to Troy to rescue his first love, you see. I see. Well, that certainly is worthy of development. In addition to this, Mr. Colby is a farmer, a designer of farm yep. implements, uh, much in the manner of his friend, uh, Louis Brownfield, who has written the introduction uh, to this book. Also, he is the author of some articles and uh, two books, A History of Truck, the Trick Industry, is that correct? Motor Truck Industry, that's right. And of Farm Machinery. That's right. Well, a little bit about the book which this incredible uh, gentleman has produced. It is called An Ironic Tale. Perhaps the word tale needs a little explanation. It isn't precisely a story. It is a tale. That means, of course, that there is an emphasis on plot, not a concern with minute involutions of the uh, human mind as the uh, characters are delineated to you. Uh, action moves over a long area. The story is in a framework. It begins with the old philosopher and the pupil, and the philosopher sends the pupil out on the quest to the answer, the great answer. The philosopher tells the pupil he may find the answer anywhere. The pupil decides to find the answer in the city because he likes it in the city. Soon he has good reason to like it in the city in the form of a blonde Corinthian whom he follows to her abode. Smitten each with the other, 
He begs leave to enter the house with her. The old woman who guards the door asks for money, but having a soft heart and also working on the philosophy that a broken heart belongs in everyone's life, Fides, the young man, is permitted to enter. The next night, no. Go fill your purse with money. The peregrinations follow. I'm not going to try to describe them now. Ultimately, Fides comes back. Many years later, having seen quite a number of persons, he comes to the temple, but this time the old woman says, no, there's no blonde Corinthian here. Well, of course you have guessed it. The blonde Corinthian is now at the door. Uh, she, too, had a young man who had once gone away. Meanwhile, as an epilogue, the philosopher who has been sleeping on the hillside wakes up and says, Eureka, I have the answer to the great question. But unfortunately, there's nobody there to hear it, and so he goes to sleep again. Well, now, Len, what do we want to quiz Mr. Covey about? What do we want to start with? Well, Herb is such a versatile individual, it's difficult to tell where to start. You name some of the great moderns with whom he's associated. I'm going to uh, name some of the great books with which we might associate his books for purposes of comparison. Uh, first, I think I, we ought to point out that there have been great satires written, uh, doing, in a manner of speaking, the same thing that uh, Mr. Kobe has done in his book, uh, a satire of a man looking for the truth and for happiness. Voltaire uh, did it in Candide, uh, Johnson did it in Rasselas, uh, in a sense, uh, Jonathan Swift did it in Gulliver's Travels, and others have done it. Uh, what I'd like to ask you at the start, Herb, is uh, what is it that your book does that uh, these people haven't done? What is it that's new in your contribution? I don't know if there's anything especially new, certainly not in technique. I'm just deliberately uh, choosing an age-old technique of a storyteller a technique that's older than Genesis. It's as old as Aesop. Uh, the only thing perhaps that could be regarded as new is a, uh, in the satire, I am satirizing modern countries, such as France and Russia, and uh, modern morals, if they've changed any. I'm not sure they have. <laughs> uh, that would be the only thing I'd have in mind. Uh, I realize the book has been compared often to uh, Voltaire's Candide. I wasn't conscious of that when I was writing it. Uh, I thought of it more, um, well, closer really to the uh, storytelling of Sholem Aleichem, in the sense that it tells a moral, you know, uh, with perhaps a little satirical humor. Well, uh, if that's your intention, if it's the moral, suppose we shift to this point. Uh, the conclusion of your book, The Moral, as is the moral of Candide and uh, Gulliver and Rasselas, uh, it's quite pessimistic. The suggestion is that uh, man's lot on earth is not a happy one. Uh, I noticed you uh, rephrase the famous Greek statement, call no man happy until he's dead, uh, which is not an especially cheerful no. point of view. And there are a number of, uh, oh, rather uh, satiric comments on man's possibilities for happiness. What I'd like to ask you now, since we have you on the griddle, is, is that pessimistic point of view your own personal philosophy, or is it something that was useful for the writing of your book? Uh, you realize, of course, that's a tough question. <laughs> <laughs> that's why we <laughs> I'm glad you did. I suppose I've never really examined it objectively. I think probably it is my own personal feeling. Uh, the essence of what, I'm, what I meant to say was we pay in life in exact proportion to our ambition. Uh, early in the book, the old woman tells him one part of the truth he was searching for, in which she said, if you expect nothing from life, you'll get bad. If you expect more than nothing, you'll get less. And uh, what she's telling him, in essence, is stay home with this lovely little blonde. Uh, what's the use of going all over the world, you know? This is happiness uh, within the limits of what we can have. The only thing I wonder about, whenever I do talk about my book, uh, is it always sounds so much different than uh, it reads. I would imagine that uh, the people listening to this would uh, have a feeling now we're dealing with a rather, uh, or rather complicated book. It actually, uh, I, I think you'd agree, it's simply written to the point of being naive. Uh, yes, that I think uh, we ought to admit at the start. This is a, a beautifully pure 
book. The style is very simple. It's uh, uh, almost biblical in its simplicity. There's no attempt at finesse or uh, esoteric symbolism or confusion. It, it's told about as simply as a story can be told. But as long as you brought in the beautiful little blonde, Herb, uh, let's take care of her next. Now, mm -hmm. the, a good deal of the interest in this uh, book, as the cameraman indicated before we began, uh, depends on sex. There's a good deal of uh, rather passionate activity throughout this book. Now, are you suggesting in the book that sex is, comes closest to giving the truth of life, or are you using it as a gimmick, a device, to get the reader's interest and uh, his sale? Well, it isn't a device, no. Uh, I can't really go into this too much, you know. You've got me trapped a bit here. <laughs> I'll get back to one thing. You mentioned the, uh, in, the, in regard to the style, you mentioned the word biblical. And I'm rather glad you did, because I had it in mind. Uh, it seemed to me that I, uh, one of the reasons I wrote this book, wrote it the way I did, and as short as I did, is it was something of a revolt uh, with me against the long books that were well-made, pre-digested, gave no room for their audience to think, or provoked no ideas and uh, very often said little. Now, I don't want to get in a quarrel with the other authors uh, who do that sort of thing. Many of them do it very well with real artistry. But uh, I've always been a little bit partial to the simpler type of writing, such as the writing in Genesis. If you remember how Genesis begins, uh, in the beginning God created heaven and the earth. Well, if you give a southern novel that theme, the creation of heaven and earth, that's 20 volumes, you know, before heaven and earth got created. Well, I was trying to go back to the old oral type of storytelling, you see. Well, if you're, if you're telling the story, story orally, you can't do very much about stream of conscience. You know, you can't get involved in that trap. Uh, you have to tell the story. All right, well, I'll grant you... Uh, now, you want to go back to the blind style? <laughs> I'll bring you back uh, less painfully. Let's put it this way. Uh, is it your intention to suggest in the book that love comes ah, close to being yes, yes. one of the yes. great truths. <coughs> I'm an awful romantic, I suppose. I, I insisted, as uh, I suppose every reader of your book will insist, that yes, he knows what the philosopher would say if anybody had been there to listen, and that was my answer. Is that the correct answer, or is that the kind of question I have no business asking of an author of an erotic tale? Well, I don't know. Just how do you mean? Uh, that the philosopher with love that makes uh, the, the life worth living, and, but uh, he finds people are not about to hear it and so goes back to sleep. Yes, that's right. So uh, the, my idea there is that many people are incapable of love of any kind, and uh, many of them who have it don't recognize it. And if uh, <laughs> a fair amour that occurs in this book is, uh, a, is an expression of their love and to this very naive character, this Don Quixote type of character, it's the finest expression. See? So at that moment, he is happy. Yeah. You see? And now to recapture that happy, he thinks he can pass this along to everyone else. Well, that's quite a trick, you know, uh, what he has in mind. Of course, our boy gets involved along the way with other friends. Yes, and, and he's, a little, uh, he's a little foolish. Uh, <laughs> well, I'll let that go. I'll no, I don't mind finishing it. For instance, uh, the point I was making when he became involved with others, uh, he could have been happy with them also. But he insisted on being unhappy by assuming he couldn't, you see. If he just stopped a little while longer with the uh, young widow, I think he might have found the same kind of truth that he did with the blonde, you see. Uh -huh. Well, let's uh, approach it this way. A moment ago, I asked you whether the pessimism in uh, the book was your own or was an author's, any author's. And uh, the reason I asked that was that you clearly impressed Dave and me as a genial and pleasant individual, happily married, and father uh -huh. and a businessman, and working hard. Uh, what business do you have claiming in your book that life is so futile and frustrating when here you are a picture of health and good food? Well, <laughs> in other words, the way I live is contradictory to what well, I just, say I'm I believe. I'm just asking. You know? I'm just asking. <laughs> well, well, may, uh, give me a, let me give him an assist on that. Yeah. Uh, would you care to explain why I reacted as I did? How's that? Well, I, if I were to describe your book in a single term, I would say it is a charming story. Now, that isn't reflecting pessimism. It isn't also, I hope, reflecting obtuseness on my part. Is that your intention, to make this 
not like satire so much as a a charming uh, picture. Yes, I am. Uh, I'm not above telling a story. I'm not above entertaining my audience, which a large group of audi or authors since the 1920s seem to like to avoid in the word of, in the name of art. Uh, I was trying to entertain deliberately. That I was trying to do. I don't like to bore people, and that's why I wrote the book in this way. It is, if you, if, you, if you are concerned about how I feel, I will say this. This is a subjective emotional expression, the book is, on my part. Uh, one of the things I learned very recently is that I was living a happy life while I wasn't completely aware of it. Now, that boy in that book had a terrific life. He traveled all over. He had a wonderful time, see? But he went through it all not knowingly. In other words, it's a bluebird again. In this, in this it's a... Uh, which is still an honest and a uh, fairly truthful expression. Okay. Uh, how about the foolish sailor? He fascinated me. In the book, as uh, a story develops, uh, Fides finds the foolish sailor in a boat which is patched up not very well. Uh, the foolish sailor, a sun worshiper, enthusiastic, uh, capable of sailing a boat which leaks, but, well, which won't leak because he doesn't think it leaks, I suppose. Uh, what did you intend by the foolish sailor? It seems as though you liked him pretty much. Is he yes, representing yes. Uh, a point of view you're trying to sell? Whatever, he, whatever I say in the book, uh, I say to him, and um, I use that type of character deliberately. At this point, I think it could be called a trick. Uh, the use of a fool on stage, for instance, uh, is always gives the author uh, more room for expression. For instance, the fool in Lear. All through the play, he's telling the truth. All th during the play, people would only listen to him. But because he's a fool, uh, they don't listen. Consequently, he has room to say more, you see? Yes. And uh, see, the, say, is the story of Socrates again, as long as he was regarded as a fool, uh, he was free to do as he wanted. As soon as he be became recognized as a philosopher, he was assassinated, you see? So in the guise of a fool, you can say a lot of things on stage or in a book that you couldn't say any other way. And uh, it gives you more freedom. I think you yes, know that. I think you've done that. And I think we might point out at this point, and you're obviously not in a position to do so, that uh, you do entertain. This book uh, has some charming passages uh, when you show uh, the difference between the tyranny of one dictatorship and the tyranny of another dictatorship. Well, then why don't you sketch that out? I know our well, uh, minutes, uh, the, the Fides and the foolish sailor land in a country where people are being assassinated by a uh, uh, dictatorial ruler and his army, uh, they're immediately thrown into jail uh, with uh, a revolutionary. They spend about 10 years there. At the end of that time, there's a revolution. The revolutionaries get out with them and immediately afterwards kill uh, the previous rulers and uh, throw our friends in jail for another 10 years on exactly the same charges, uh, except deeper down in the dungeon than they had been. Uh, there's a good deal of that kind of charming satire and irony. Uh, but I want to shift now to a uh, more serious discussion of the philosophy that I think you clearly expressed through the foolish sailor, and that is this. You have your sailors say, the world will not be improved by political means, by economic change, by religious revival. It will only be improved by each individual man developing his own personality. Do you want to defend that uh, yes, completely, dude? I think uh, I really believe that. And also I believe that all history at this moment uh, proves what I say, that uh, the climb up, this, the climb up to civilization is uh, meticulously slow. And it's, it's dependent on the individual rather than on a political system or any other social system or any religious system. All of those can be of assistance, and generally they're expressions of the individual. That is, the individual advances in civilization, develops a better political system, you see. But the system alone doesn't free us from the jungle. Would you suggest then that uh, under fascism or communism, it's as easy to develop uh, the human spirit, let's say, as no. it would be under democracy? No, I see what you're getting at. No, and I don't think that fascism is the natural expression today of the, the advance we have made. And that's why fascism defeats itself. That's why communism is bound to defeat itself. It is not the natural, we have gone too far 
It can't exist. It can't coexist with the people that are living on this earth today, you see. I don't believe that you can uh, be as... I don't believe there can be as much freedom of expression naturally under fascism as there can be under democracy. And I believe that the people today are ready for democracy. They have democracy, and when they don't have it, eventually they will. That it's a temporary thing, both fascism and communism. You wouldn't want to make it a blanket statement then that the external forces of environment have no effect at all on No, but what I say is this. Uh, you'll, if you expect too much from a system, if you expect a system to cure all our evils as we did in the 19th century, the great century of reason, you're bound to run into disillusionment, you see? Now there's a way of being happy by seeing the system for what it is and what it can do and not expect too much from human beings or systems or what. Uh, to just keep our little progress up as fast as we can and don't expect any great revolution to change uh, things overnight and... Uh, is that the character of Solon in your book? Yes, it is. And uh, which... W would you care to sketch that? I'd just sketch out uh, briefly. Uh, for well, uh, Solon was a great law giver in Greece and these two men are sailing around the Mediterranean and they come near Athens and uh, I've invented this scene, of course. It didn't actually occur in history. We have the picture of Solon being chased through the streets by the crowd. Now, actually, Solon was an exile from Greece, and he was a very great ruler and a very good ruler. But uh, he brought too much good to his people, and they couldn't stand too much prosperity. So we have this scene of his being chased through the streets, and finally he jumps into the water and swims out to this little boat. And they pull him aboard, and they begin their... Uh, and they continue their adventures, rather, with Solon in uh, their company. They end up in the land of Croesus, that's Lydia, and he was supposedly the richest man in the world. And Croesus, Croesus put the question to him uh, after showing him all his wealth and his harem and the other things that make men happy, uh, who's the happiest man in the world? And Solon answers, as he uh, historically uh, did answer, you can't crown the wrestler still in the ring. You'll never know if a man's happy till his life is over. And Solon and Croesus, rather, feel this is very foolish not to take present happiness into the balance. And the uh, end of the story proves the, uh, the moral that uh, Solon was right, that you can't judge your happiness for your, what you have presently. You say. As long as you've uh, come to the end of the story in your discussion, suppose uh, we ask this, Herb. Right. Uh, I suppose you're aware of the fact that the end of your story is almost the same as the end of Candide and Rasselas and the others, and the end is always uh, frustrating. <laughs> the boys learn at the end that uh, there's no future. There's well, no, not that. I think you, if I were trying to teach anything, and I'm aware of the fact that I'm trying to teach, uh, I'm trying to teach patience, not to expect too much. This, young, this boy spend a, dedicated a life towards solving something that could be done in a lifetime. That if he'd just been patient and stayed with the blonde Corinthian and done what little he could do in his own little circle, why, he had contributed toward the advance of civilization and the step towards eternal happiness. You'd agree in other words, eternal happiness, I don't say is impossible. I just say it's impossible to do it quickly. And those who expect to do it quickly very often do more damage than they do good. In my case, slowly. Uh, yeah. Candy said at the end of his book, uh, this is all very well, but let us cultivate our, our garden. garden. <laughs> you would agree with that. Let us cultivate our garden. Especially in, in Iowa, Iowa, you'd want to repeat that. As a, ma <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think. as a matter of fact, the uh, publisher left a page out of my book, which was the first page, and I had that quotation from Voltaire. Oh, did you? <laughs> yeah. That's, That's the key. Uh, I was wondering, when you were talking about Solon, whether you would be uh, willing to accept a, a position of another contemporary writer for whom I think both Len and I have a good deal of respect, uh, Al Cap, and his invention <laughs> of the schmoon, <laughs> that yes, they're too good for people. No, the world's not ready for the schmoon. The world's <laughs> not ready for the schmoon. <laughs> well, perhaps we could move on to this question, Herb. I think our audience would be very interested in it. You're going to dramatize this uh, play, uh, this story, or tale. Yes. Uh, have you any plans for a change to make it uh, dramatic, or... How does it break itself down? Well, uh, it's uh, written in a good bit theatrical technique. The advantage of theatrical technique is this. Uh, you can't bore an audience in the theater. Uh, if you write a novel and you have two or three boring chapters, they can be skipped, you know. But in the theater, if you uh, lose your audience for a scene, you've lost the play. They leave. They don't come back. You've got to flop. So it's a very demanding kind of writing. 
And this, uh, since my first training is in the theater, is written in theatrical technique, which means the oral tale, the spoken tale. And it's not difficult to dramatize. Uh, it's a little hard to explain since uh, I'm sure a large part of your audience hasn't read the book. Well, <laughs> we hope they remedy it. Yeah, yes, that would be nice. <laughs> but uh, I expect there will be some changes, yes. Uh, not too many. Uh, not not plot-wise. I can't use all the book in the uh, play. I must select certain sections to dramatize. Well, I hope you don't. I hope you don't scrap that meeting with the foolish sailor. No, that that uh, although it's a small scene, it's uh, relatively speaking, it's compared in time with the in the land of the dictators. I, I'd hate to lose it. He's uh, he's too too good a character. To, uh, uh, are you going to keep uh, your blind god of wealth who passes it out? the money always to the wrong people, and are you going to keep insisting on the idea that uh, the best thing man can have is poverty, because only poverty keeps us honest and striving? Well, I think you realize I didn't really mean that. Uh, when uh, this young man uh, finally comes to a place where he has a chance to cure the god of uh, wealth of his blindness so that the just people in the world can have the wealth, and he meets the goddess of poverty, and she explains to him that would wreck civilization since everything good in the world is done by the poor. When uh, he does leave her, why, she's, uh, and she's won the argument with this simple, naive character, she says, well, I'll always win as long as men think themselves reason reasonable and have no confidence in their fellow men. You see, I really do believe the just people in the world should, be, should have the wealth. <laughs> and you really believe they don't? I believe... It's very hard for him to get it. <laughs> that was a reply of a <laughs> tactful thought. Uh, the kind of reply that I think uh, you may expect frequently in the book, The Blonde Corinthian. Well, Herb, I, I hate very much to stop this show, but I've just been given the signal that uh, our time is just about out. We have a duty to our audience for next week's show. Thank you very much, Herbert Kobe, and the best wishes for your many projects, and for the success of this in play form. And thank you for coming. Thank you, Len Feinberg. Thank you. Next week, we're going to do The Naked and the Dead by Norman Mailer. To do that, we will have Major T.N. Green, the Iowa State College, and Dick Hartzell from the Adult Education uh, Foundation here at the Iowa State College. The Naked and the Dead by Norman Mailer is a book which has caused considerable talk. Perhaps the largest, I'm not sure, but I think perhaps the largest of the war novels, one which has endured now a couple of years, is a little more than a war novel, and which I trust many of you know, if not at first hand, at least by review. I look forward to seeing you again next week. Thank you very much. Dr. David Bruner and Dr. Leonard Feinberg of Iowa State College and Herbert Kobe of Galeon, Ohio have discussed Mr. Kobe's new novel, The Blonde Corinthian. Charles Hawley was technical director and Neil Mailer produced and directed tonight's edition of Books on Trial. This is Fred Drabland inviting you to join us next Tuesday at 8.30.